start recording, which we are. So welcome once again to the Rugby Canada webinar series. Uh, as you can tell, we're starting to kind of phase them out a little bit. We're not, not wanting to run these, but uh, what we've seen is that there's interest in other areas of the game and stuff. And so what we're gonna try and do is uh, build on our um, return to play content to make sure that we've got some, some content coming up for the end of July and then the beginning of August through August. And then uh, hopefully by the time September rolls around, we've got some pretty decent rugby happening. So for tonight though, uh, we've got Mr. John Lavery, who's joined us all the way from Montreal. Uh, welcome, John. Good to see you. Thanks for having me, Nathan, and uh, thanks to anybody else for tuning in. Yeah, so uh, first of all, also just a reminder that uh, we uh, have lifted rugby suspension. So for those of you who are interested in getting back uh, on the field, please do reach out to your club or your provincial union, and they'll be able to provide all the information that you uh, would require for that. Uh, tonight's presentation by John is going to be focused on his career as a scrum coach slash head coach and uh, and where the scrum has taken him in that regard, as well as obviously some of the technical tidbits that are going to help uh, all you scrum gurus out there from the very basics all the way up to hopefully high performance levels of of rugby. So, uh, John, if you don't mind, first of all, do a quick little introduction. So, the webinar is presented by DHL. Thank you to DHL for helping us do this. I'll get the plug in there. And then, uh, secondly, John, for those who don't know, John Lavery, head coach at the moment of Concordia University senior men's team and uh, or varsity men's team, I suppose, and uh, former and current uh, national age grade coach right now with the U18s. Not yeah. right now. We're still. <laughs> and uh, waiting to see what happens with that but u18 scrum coach head coach at concordia been involved with age grade programs as long as i've been around refereeing that's for sure and uh john and i go back far enough at national championships and such so it's good to see you john thanks for taking the time we did a bit of a run through everything looks good so i'm going to hand over the presentation reins to you feel free to add to the intro and uh she's all yours mate oh Sorry, John, one more thing, just for our viewers out there, uh, just to make sure that you all know how to use your uh, control panel function on the right hand side, you will have a uh, question box. Please feel free to enter your questions. En français aussi, si vous voulez, je vais essayer de traduire pour John. Par contre, je sais qu'il travaille sur son français, n'est-ce pas? Oui, absolument. Excellent. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so we'll do about 40, 45 minutes with John. Uh, if we have some time for some questions in between and they're really pertinent to the topic, we'll throw some in there. We'll wrap up with a few other questions. And then, John, we've got about an hour and I'm really looking forward to uh, what you got. So let me yeah, fire this over cool. to you and um, all yours. Awesome. So um, we'll start going through the the presentation I got going, but if uh, Nathan, if things come up that are kind of topical to what's going on in the, in the slideshow, uh, feel free to interrupt and uh, we can kind of tangent and stuff because uh, I know people have a, have actually had like a whole bunch of questions offline uh, have shot messages out and really appreciate it. So um, I think where I kind of wanted to start where which was the the journey to becoming a scrum coach is which is kind of weird because you know you're a Canadian player um, who is not really interested in coaching, and the next thing you know, like you're titling yourself as a scrum coach, which is which is kind of surreal at times. Um, but there was actually like a pretty clear process to it, um, and like the title of the show says, uh, it was pretty uncomfortable, but definitely worth the while. Um, so. We'll start with a little bit about the journey. So uh, the coaching journey for me really starts at St. Anne de Belvey Rugby Football Club, where Nathan, I'm pretty sure you ref me a, a more than a few times. Yeah. Um, uh, where I was really sort of coaching out of necessity and not desire. Because like if most people be able to relate to the fact that coaching club would be, could be a bit like herding cats. like. You know, it's a, it's a it's a pretty tough job in the sense that you don't always have uh, the the guys around and like the commitment level that you would want, but uh, we all do it and we love it. Um, but it's just to sort of like reflect that, like my experience started with having no experience. Um, all I had was playing and the internet, and that was really where the whole thing got started. Um, 
back and back then though, there used to be a lot of really good stuff that the NZRU had out on their coaching toolbox, and that's where I discovered Mike Cron. So I spent a lot of time watching Mike Cron videos and trying to sort of copy what I saw there, um, which is really where a lot of people get started. Um, and then once I sort of got my my feet wet coaching at the club level, um, I think a lot of people would be pretty familiar with Andy Plymer who's uh, got that Rugby Coaches Corner podcast. Yeah, uh, we, had him, we had him on a couple of weeks ago. He spoke very highly of you, John. He said he was looking forward to this. Well, um, to be honest, he's a large part of why I'm doing what I'm doing. Because uh, the, the conversation started around like the fact that there was an under-20 national championship in Canada and that Quebec didn't have a team in it and it had no players in the Canada under-20 program. And so he decided that he was going to take the initiative of start starting a program himself. And he got me and this other fellow, John Weller, on board um, as our manager. And that morphed into the Voyagers, which incorporated the Eastern Ontario Rugby Union, which were like pretty positive partners of ours for like a good long time. Um, and that was really under the direction of Mike Shelley, who was the, the performance manager, I think, at the time. Um, you got a lot of good people working together and that that under 19 process has been pretty consistent ever since and uh, it's been a real pleasure to be part of. Um, and I guess the where this is going is that once you start this stuff and you you get a taste for it. Um, there's a lot of opportunity out there and people will kind of invite you to do little bits and pieces and I just kept saying yes and so I ended up working the women's game a lot. Uh, with the U20 women and the senior women. Uh, I got into coaching university rugby at uh, McGill with the women. And that's sort of led me to, to here with the, the Concordia men. But when you think about that, that's like seven or eight different teams that you're involved with in a pretty short period of time. And I guess all of those opportunities lead to just a broader scope of experience and a huge learning curve. Um, and the big thing that I learned out of it was a sense of gratitude is just getting the opportunity to be part of so many really great people's like journeys as players, as, as co-coaches, as, uh, I guess officials to some degree, uh, with Chris Micheletti, who was a huge help with our Quebec under 19 program, traveling around with us and, uh, reffing our games and giving us feedback and all that kind of good stuff. Um, it's been it's been a bit of a ride, and it should always be a privilege, and it should always be a pleasure. Uh, at least that's how it should feel. Um, and the last thing I really want to say about that is that there's a lot of things that can kind of distract you from that, and the less time you spend thinking about them, the happier you're probably going to be as a coach, um, especially in Canada with so many like challenges. But uh, you know, it 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 always seems to be worthwhile in the end. Um, but then in terms of like boxing this whole thing in, so where I'm coming from was we started with, uh, out of the U19s, some coaches were identified and incorporated into a Canada U17 program. So we had an East and a West, uh, it involved also some really great people. And you can see a picture there as Andy Plymer and Jack Hanratty when we were with Canada East. Um, that was an extremely uncomfortable experience. And I'm sure Nathan, as a as an official and an official developer, you'll understand how challenging that can be when you go from co coaching or refing in the in an area where people aren't necessarily paying attention to your performance so much, yeah. or um, or challenging on challenging you on your processes. When we got into that environment, you know, it was the first time I'd ever been mic'd up as a coach or videoed as a coach, and uh, you, you sort of feel like you're under a bit of a microscope. I'm pretty sure you can relate to that. Um, but Maybe. it was a pretty incredible experience that uh, you kind of grow to miss when you don't have, when you go back to coaching in places that don't have those resources or those like, you know, honest and uh, knowledgeable sounding boards. John, mate, I don't know. I was, when we, when we chatted earlier today, I didn't mention it, but I wanted to save it for tonight. But I remember that tournament, the U17 East West in Langford. Yeah. And I remember how green, because we hadn't really done a whole lot of the miking of coaches and the feedback process yeah. and, and all that. And it wasn't just you who was green. Jack was pretty green at the time. 
climber at the at the age grade level uh, oh, yeah. it was pretty green so there was a ton of work going into it and yeah it was a learning experience for everybody but and you you and i have done this before where we've actually sat down we've used the same video we've had the same look at it we've been able to have conversations about well what does this actually mean there was no tur like tournament or matches that came out of this it was pure learning but man yeah. you were in the deep end right a hundred percent and you don't feel green until you're in it yeah. once you're in it like boy oh boy does like the temperature turn up quick in the room yeah um and that's actually where uh, we started the level three process. And I'll, I'll never forget it. Like the, the, basically when I did that, uh, that level three development camp, it was, um, it was Andrew Hall who basically taught me how to use PowerPoint and started filming me when I wasn't watching, like when I was speaking uh, to a group. And he, he gave me like some incredible feedback on like just delivery, cadence, voice, tone, uh, and body language. It, it was the first time I've ever even considered those things as being important at all. Mm -hmm. Like, like wasn't coaching just about like kind of telling people where to put their hands and like how to catch a ball. Right. That's sort of where my mind was at when I started, but it, it changed pretty fast. Um, and just being around peers of, uh, of that caliber was definitely a, like a, a comfort bubble burster for sure. Yeah. And I got the, the U18 stuff and like just playing a little word association game, the unfinished. We started this this group. Uh, I've been with them for like five years with the current crop of them. We've been together for almost two because my current picked a young group. Yeah. And we had a really great tour to San Diego this year. And uh, it just feels like, you know, fruit dying on the vine, not being able to play that series with the States at Brentwood this summer. Would have been incredible. Great staff. Great players, uh, real pleasure. Uh, the under 20 women that uh, is headed by Jack Henratty. Uh, the word I associate with those guys is professional. Like he has a really, really strong program mind. And it felt pretty different to a lot of other things I've been involved in, which uh, felt like being in a team, but he really had a developmental process in mind for the athletes. And it was really rewarding being part of that. Uh, also being part of an incredible staff with like legends like Kelly Russell and Josh Berrio. Uh, and lastly, I did a single tour with uh, the senior women to England. And the only word is inspirational is like coaching with, with players like that. You kind of got to bring your A game every time you, you talk out because boy, oh boy, they, A, they deserve it, but B, like they know their stuff and uh, they want the best and they want to be coached hard and it is incredibly rewarding uh working with players like that um and again like back to that idea of gratitude and, and feeling privileged to be part of it that was quite something uh some incredible like they're world class and you know when you look in the mirror like you're asking yourself questions like should you even be here and uh like i said it challenges you personally to step your game up pretty hard. Um, so back to really the thrust of where this is going is the, the growth experiences that lead to me becoming like a scrum coach and specializing in a particular area. So part of that level three process and part of the U17 process was identifying some long-term goals for yourself as a coach and where do you want to be in five, 10 years? And so I said, I wanted to be an age grade scrum coach with Canada. And so I remember Dustin Hopkins sitting down with me and saying like, well, if that's what you want to do, then this is how you got to go about doing it. Um, and in 2010, Mike Cron came to Canada. And for the people who might not know, uh, Mike is the four or was the forwards coach for the All Blacks uh, up through the 2019 World Cup. Okay. Um, I sort of first encountered material that he put online with the, uh, the New Zealand rugby coaching toolbox. Uh, and the stuff that really struck me was like just fundamentally the quality of the instruction, super clear language, uh, a very pleasant cadence, tone of voice, um, and a really empathetic kind of approach to the, to the players. Very different to, to what I had experienced up to that point. Um, and uh, I think, getting into that environment the first time was my first exposure to like the different 
sort of modes of coaching and the different kind of like speeds that they operate at. So, you know, over the course of a week, we did a couple of days where he was just teaching, which is like giving information. Then he had a couple of days where he did some assessment, where he put some guys under pressure. And obviously this was geared around picking a 2011 Rugby World Cup side. And I got to be party to like the discussions around how the camp had gone, who was performing well, who needed to work on what, um, and what the decision-making processes were gonna be made around. And then I saw some work that he did as development, which was he had like a couple of squads and he worked them really, really hard. He built them as a unit. Um, and it was a really clear shift in, in tone and in type of, in, of intensity at the training sessions. And the other thing that was really uh, kind of just strange to me was how everyone kept smiling and laughing all the time. Like it never stopped being fun, even when it got incredibly hard. And I think that there's an art to that that not everybody necessarily can do, but I found that to be a pretty special experience. You know, you know what struck me just now, John, was it, you mentioned he, he's talking about selection for 2011 World Cup and things players still need to work on. And you would think at that level, right? Like, what do they still need to work on? They either are a little bit better than the next guy or they're not, right? And yeah, um, but but the, that constant focus on on development of players in in a variety of skill sets, I think, is is a unique mindset and something that that you know, could certainly take away. It just struck me anyways, as you were talking about it. Well, it's something that, I mean, like, I don't know uh, these coaches personally, but I listen to a lot of podcasts. Um, and there's some really incredible stuff on the Magic Academy and uh, on Off the Ball, which is the, an RTE podcast that a lot of the, the Kiwi coaches talk about player development on an ongoing, continuous basis. And that the higher you go, the greater the expectation of your commitment to that is, which is sort of counterintuitive when you think about like, you know, a guy making it to the to all blacks level, a guy who is at that level needs to be spending those extra minutes on the fundamental skills of the game because they don't necessarily have a heck of a lot of time to work on those in the training session. And so those extras become the standard. It's not necessarily something the coach mandates, but it's expected of you to do. Um, and you, you saw that rub off where like uh, Pat Reardon was the captain at the time and you saw him doing a heck of a lot, heck of, a lot of that. And you saw some guys kind of feeding off that and doing those extra bits. And you could, you could see at the Rugby World Cup that it really did help. Um, some of those players like had some pretty momentous tournaments in terms of their performance and stuff. And it was really great to watch. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of like the other growth experiences that really stand out to me is like uh, Dave Butcher uh, arriving in Canada. Uh, he's the head coach of the Queen's University men's rugby program, but other than that, he's a good guy. Um, <laughs> he, uh, he's listening, by the way, I, I think he might be. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Um, but I think when i when i met dave i again i had like a pretty uh pretty narrow scope of experience in terms of like what i've been exposed to so like i mentioned like you know i was on the internet i knew what i knew as a player and i'd been to this camp but like i said like i encountered my crun before i got into scrum coaching uh then really that the, the new zealand method was really all i'd been exposed to it's all i knew um, and when I met Dave, it was really like, it was a challenge to the ideas I thought I had. Um, and it was definitely stimulating talking to somebody who would nerd out as hard as I would about the topic. Um, and like, you can see that his change in body language, every time he gets to talk about it, he, uh, you know, he just lights up, loves it. Um, loves to talk about different ideas, loves to talk about process, super detail oriented. Um, and just being around people that have the passion for any area of the game really is really stimulating to be around. And like, since he's been here, he's, he's probably influenced as many coaches as any other coach in the country uh, that work with forwards. Um, and that's a pretty strong testament to the kind of guy he is and how open he is with sharing information and sharing ideas and uh, just being a good person, really. 
I'm I'm, um, I'm waiting I'm waiting for the gloating on social media to come in a. Oh in a, my gosh, uh, I yes. I'm not looking forward to it. <laughs> but I said it anyways. So, John, there's really a couple with it. There is a couple of questions coming in relation to what you're talking about, but you know what? Just oh great, I, great. no, absolutely. No, no, mate. Like, I think just for time, just for time, we'll 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 keep moving on, uh, and we will come back because it's a big part of the the coaching process piece that you're going to go through. It's a big part of it. So no, keep keep going, but we'll come back to them. All right. So, um, one of the other pieces here that I want to talk about was a little bit around the Canadian context of like how we acquire information and how we, uh, how we use it. So you've got people out there with some really great information and some great experience that they can share with you. And the important thing is to connect what you're learning from those experiences to what you already know from your own. It doesn't replace what you know. Like the, the, the way to evolve as a coach is not to necessarily copy the techniques or the principles of somebody else or what their beliefs are, but to take the pieces that, that resonate with you and blend them with your own. Because the other piece that uh, I hadn't really mentioned before that came from Mike Cron and came from Dave Butcher that they both said repeatedly is there is no dogma to this. There is no right way. This is not me telling you how to do something because it's the best way. It's just what I believe to be the best way. And that, that openness to, uh, to, to challenging their ideas, the, the respect for the fact that other people have a different experience is something that coaches should take into everything they do all the time. Um, and the idea that the experiences that you have as a coach are gonna challenge your thoughts or they're gonna reinforce them, but they don't replace them. It's, it should be a dynamic process which is again, something that when I was making that transition from player to, to player coach to coach, I was just kind of running around copying stuff that I saw. And I wasn't necessarily thinking about why I was doing things. I was just thinking about what to do. And the next step after that is definitely deciding on what your whys are and deciding what your beliefs are. Boom. Okay, so to close the loop, the coaching experience so far is I know what I've done, me as a player, observation, finding people that are successful in your area. And so the picture that I chose here is Jace Ryan. He's the current Crusader Scrum coach, um, which is arguably the most successful scrum engineering unit on the planet. Uh, historically has been so as well. Um, the other thing that resonates with me about where he comes from is he's not a former crusader himself. He was, he's not a pro, he is a pro coach. Um, he came through the club system in, uh, in Christchurch. And that is another, it's a strong testament to, to the way that they view things is it's not just enough to be a former international player or, or whatever. Your credibility as a coach comes from your coaching and this guy is someone that to me demonstrates that principle like to the utmost. Uh, again, super open with the sharing of information. He does a lot of podcasts. He shares a lot of stuff on the rugby site. Um, and it's always engaging and interesting. It's, it's different language attacking the same principles and stuff that a lot of other people have talked about before, but just hearing a different voice expressing it in a different way is gonna add to the learning. And then the critical thinking is you've got all those nuggets, you bring them into your own practice and decide what makes sense to you. The other piece is when you bring something into your practice and you introduce it in your team, the competition is gonna dictate whether you keep it or not. So if you find something that's effective and it works for you, then that thing needs to stay. You don't change it just because someone else said it's a good idea. But when you see things that in your own practice that you know, maybe could stand for some growth, chances are there's some there's something to be learned somewhere in there. That picture is a, is a player, uh, Jackson Markhart, who got uh, parachuted into a Canada 18s tour to Wales. Well, we actually got to play like three tests against Wales, England, and Italy, yeah. which is definitely one of the highlights of my rugby career in any sense. Um, 
but his learning curve for that tour was absolutely monumental because he, he's a kid that we really he wasn't even playing rep rugby but he was somebody that was in the academy and he was working hard and he's a big body and he got parachuted in and he started just about every game uh so like just having having that connection to what you know makes the teaching process a heck of a lot easier is really where i'm going with that yeah 100 percent So back to the spectrum of the coaching. So you've got this motivational piece, which carries into the instruction. It's like the giving of information, recognizing potential in players, developing their skill set to reach that potential. And then this piece just here reflects building a relationship with the guys over time. Uh, which is something else that uh, there were some questions about guys and like their mile markers for as a scrummager, what they need to learn when. And my response was all about being patient with with new players and uh, with scrummaging technique, because it is not something that you learn overnight. It's not super intuitive for some people. Um, but the sharing knowledge and seeking advice. All of those things share an equal importance with what our process is as a scrum coach. And we'll sort of like close some of those loops in a bit. So now we're gonna get into sort of the nuts and bolts of scrummaging um, and the why bother. So what does a good scrummage give to you as a, as a, as a team? Um, the scrum is an attacking weapon in the sense that it's able to generate points. Um, two, the scrum is a chance to dominate the opposition. So like Sean McDonough refers to the field of battle and the scrum being like the first point of engagement with the enemy. Um, and I think a lot of people that, that love that part of the game would reflect the same, the same feeling. The scrum is a chance to manipulate opposition and create attacking opportunities and eliminate attacking opportunities when on defense. And it's a chance to build pressure on the opposition. So the first piece is gonna talk a little bit about the pressure and the attacking weapon. So I'm just gonna roll this clip really quick. So this is the Japanese under 20s against uh, France in 2015. Japan out, are outweighed by seven kilograms of player, which is something like 72 kilograms as a total pack. I have a quick shot, of, quick shot of that fella's body language. After being blown off the ball, You got five guys in that scrum. The entire back row was up. Not in the fight. Second time. Pressure comes on. We got a penalty. And in this case, they make a move. They're, they've actually got a guy in the bin on the, on the back of that. So France is now down to seven. Third time the discipline pays off with points. Penalty try. Happy days. 100%. So, so you, you mentioned as a coach being patient, right? Like there's an extremely incredible amount of patience on the player's part to just keep going at Absolute, it there, right? Absolutely. And it's and it's really is built on their physical capacities. Like that's an exhausting, exhausting process of of putting a team under the pump for four or five successive scrums and being able to do it with the same intensity on the fifth one that you were able to do in the first one with less than two minutes rest between reps. If you think about like doing sets of heavy squats without that like that's an impressive feat. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the big deal here is you look at, there's a bunch of players in that French pack that are that are playing in short studs. There's guys in that French pack that are wearing molded shoes. 
there's guys that look scared. There's guys whose body language is just screams defeat. And I want to just kind of like dovetail it with this guy. Mm -hmm. This is U20 as well, eh, John? This is U20 France against New Zealand. I just want to just pay attention to this fellow right here. Watch that one more time. The body language and the shove comes on, speaks a thousand words. You go far, he goes to go and give a little message to his opposite number right there. A little eye contact. How's your day? <laughs> there is not one set of short studs in that pack of eight and that scrummaging unit of a bunch of boys out there with French flags on their cleats. So in 2015, they're getting dominated by Japan and they're, they're 15 pounds heavier a guy. Five years later, they're dominating the baby blacks. And the difference to me is not a technical thing. It's somebody in that program decided scrummaging mattered, scrummaging was important. And so they put some work into it. And the difference in the weight, the performance of the two units is absolutely massive. Um, and I, I'd say you'd see this a similar thing reflected when, if you were to watch the the Canada under twenties, when you when they when they scrummage, you can see like the passion that Dave has had and put into put into those groups. They've been pretty dominant when they get it. They get into that uh, USA Test series. Yeah. And then the other piece is the building pressure on the opposition. So in the first clip, you have the added pressure of the yellow card on top of the points. So for the next 10 minutes, you're still playing a man down. But the one thing that I also like to talk about a little bit is uh, the impact that it has on like the 15. When you're able to exert that kind of pressure through your scrum, you create an incredible amount of uncertainty in the, the opposition's decision makers. If a nine puts the ball in, they're now thinking about what happens if it doesn't come out. 10 now has to like second guess every decision that they make and they become a lot more conservative or they make they make more individualistic decisions. So the impact of the psychology of the, of the, on the opposition all of a sudden completely shifts when you're able to create that kind of pressure through this area of the game. So that's where it ends, but where does it start? So we're gonna start talking a little bit about how you build guys who have the physical ability to do these things. Just like we discussed in the first clip, that I actually had to cut a couple of scrums out. Mm -hmm. That was five scrums in a row. It was the fifth yeah. one that he gave the, the try on. But five reps with that kind of the consistency and accuracy is pretty impressive. I know so, a couple of scrum coaches who would say the penalty try should have come off the first one, but we'll... <laughs> oh, like 100%. But uh, refs aren't perfect, so they say. Yeah. Um, so stuff that we're trying to do um, when we're developing a scrummager from any of the eight positions is develop their body shape. Um, to my mind, it's it's really the run catch pass the scrummaging. Uh, the concept of being in, in a bullseye position, which really just means you have a flat back, but it it's more than a flat back. It's a flat line between the ear, the shoulder, the hips, and the heels. And then you've got their ability to uh, hold that shape, which is isometric strength. It means it's, you, you're just not moving, but it's sort of in order. It's like able to get into the shape, I'm able to hold the shape. And then when you're talking about like what, uh, we had some questions around like for, for high school athletes or for like junior players, yeah. the order that we're teaching this stuff in is pretty important, especially around the safety issue. So one, they need to know what a good shape looks like. They need to know how a good shape feels. Then they have to be able to hold that shape under some pressure. Then we start talking about the dynamic power, the ability to apply the force and then recover the shape, um, which, which sounds super simple, but because it's super simple, if you get a small thing wrong, the whole thing is wrong. Right. So um, without the correct shape, 
uh, any force that's applied behind them won't be applied effectively through where the, the point of contact is in the front row. So, sorry, what was that? No, nothing, we're good. Okay, so uh, the big deal here is that um, only 38% of the scrum power is actually generated through the front row. The back five generate the other 62. So bearing that in mind, it's pretty important that all eight guys, and you're, you're talking about a club uh, or a school side that could have, you know, like 20 kids that are in your, in your forwards group, an equal attention should be given everybody around the development of those capacities. Um, and it really needs to be reflection, like a reflection of where that group is. So you cannot skip steps with this and expect not to pay for it somewhere down the track. Building the fundamental body shape, building the isometric strength first, and then build their ability to move should be done in that sequence. I, I strongly believe that to be true. Um, not everybody does. But uh, the other piece of that is it's super highly transferable to other areas of the game from a safety perspective is like this, the stronger their body shapes are, the stronger their necks are, the more balanced and stable they are, the better they're gonna be in the contact area and in the tackle. And, you know, from a, like a selfish coach's perspective, the more a guy is safe in his, in his body shapes and stuff, that means the less likely he is to get injured. That means the more he gets to train, the more he gets to train, the better he gets. The better he gets, the more successful you are. So like the safest technique and the best technique are very often the same technique. So when it comes to the transferable principles from scrum coaching to like the rest of the game and stuff, uh, we're talking about these like five different domains um, over here where we started the competence. So the teaching part is about building competence and confidence. The confidence is rooted in their ability to do something successfully repeatedly. Then the assessment stuff, that's where the character comes in when you start making selection decisions. And scrum coaches are often asked to do a, a lot of both. You do a whole bunch of teaching early on, and right. then you have to, like, it, your role in a, in a program might be to help the, the head coaches make some selection decisions and stuff. And these are some of the things that you would have insight on with the guys in the type five. Yeah. Um, and then, you have the connection and the culture, which is the competition prep piece. Um, once you've got a squad selected, is how do you harden that group up into a team that can go out there and compete for championships? So depending on where I'm at in that spectrum, how do I adapt the activities? So for example, like in the teaching phase, you might be spending a lot more time on individual technique or, um, the linear connection groups, so like the the front row with the second row behind, just sort of like mini groups working on the fundamentals, right? And the tone of your act, the tone of your approach. So sometimes, you know, you really have to. Kids typically don't need to get jacked up for scrimmaging, and they're going to feed off your energy a bit. And so, if you're in the teaching phase, really your tone needs to be a bit more dialed back, if that makes sense, um, because kids are gonna, once they're down there in a one-on-one, -on -one, the, the competition thing takes care of itself. You know right. what I mean? There's gotta be a winner, there's gotta be a loser. Yeah. You're, you're gonna have to mitigate more than in sight, if that makes sense. Um, what tools am I using? So the, that could go from anywhere between like with the scrum machine, where, where does that fit in what I'm doing? Uh, and you know, like since we're sort of gearing a lot of this towards what we're doing with young athletes, I typically stay away from it, especially early on in, for example, like a, like a, like a season's process. We focus a lot more on the individual and, uh, and like semi-competitive live work where we're focusing on developing their balance and their ability to hold their shape and move, uh, and be able to recover their shape. Um, and to like how much video I'm using. So for like a simple example of like how that changes from like one session to another is if I'm teaching a lot, well, typically we'll use like a whole bunch of these or iPad to guys to be able to like reflect and look back on what they're doing versus when you're in the competition prep phase, 
you might video the session and stuff, but you might not break as often within the session to look at what you're doing. It might not really be the focus. It might be something that you review after as a group. Right. And then the time, the time John, is the crazy one. There's a great, there's a great question here about, uh, you're talking about tone and this, this person's saying that the, the, the best scrums in the world tend to have really quiet setups in, yeah. in game. So how do you, what do you do to replicate that uh, in training? Oh, so um, one of the things um, that I do is, so again, like I, I have, um, I have a belief that the way that the All Blacks do a lot of things is both the simplest and the best. Um, and the way that the body language is reflected in their setup, can I sort of tangent and sort of break it into another presentation? Yeah. I've, got, I've got it right here. So this guy, this is the, uh, the Canada Under 18 Scrum Process document that we use, um, where our focus here is on the assembly process and giving the leadership role to one clear player uh, as assisted by another. So the hooker is gonna have a series of directives that the eight follow in their assembly. Who binds when and where, and how do they communicate that they're comfortable and ready to rock and for the next group and to join the scrum? Um, and what our process is to getting from there to into the fire position, from the fire position into the hit. Um, and when um, we're talking about like, you know, 17 year old athletes and stuff, and I'm not talking about a huge amount more than that with those guys, because very often we only have a week. And it's like they're drinking from a fire hose with how much information they get uh, hit with. So we try to sort of keep it pretty simple and keep it to that stuff. But then when I'm talking about how I want the hooker to drive the bus, what I use is examples of the body language of the all black guys and how controlled and methodical it is. No, no one's like super revved up, but no one looks tuned out either. When we're talking about this as a group, all I'm asking the boys to really look at is some of the key markers about where people's feet are, where their hands are, and how calm and focused everybody looks. All these little mini communications between guys, little taps, but everybody's really focused on getting themselves right so that they can do their job in the collective. So when I'm trying to get that, that those ideas across, those are the examples that I use. Right. And again, like I, I do, I am very conscious of like what my tone is. Um, I, I even change like, like how I stand sometimes. Like I'll go down on one knee if I wanna like really dial stuff down and I'll ask people to come down with me and we kind of chat quietly and close. Um, versus when, like, for example, you're getting ready for a playoff game and you need the boys to be revved up and we do a whole bunch of fighting and then you transition from the fight into the setup, set up into a hit on the machine, fall introduced, recovery, and then you repeat the process. The, the shift in tone and having the, the players have the ability to shift from being in a fight, which could be like, you know, being in a, in a clear out or a tackle or whatever, transitioning into something that demands it, like that they collect their focus and self-regulate, move on to the next job and then do it accurately and then have the chance to recover. It, does that sort of answer the question, yeah, I think? Absolutely. Yeah. We're just looking to translate what you're trying to do on the field to, to, bringing that back to the training that I, I think you closed that real good. Yeah. And, and it, like, it, that was the thing that, uh, again, I was like, you know, on reflection, I was like floored by, but how deep the, the planning process was for what, um, Mike Crown was trying to do with the group and how he tailored the activities and the tone of the activities to reflect what he's trying to get out of the activity. And the, the really cool thing is, uh, Kieran Crowley and Neil Barnes were the other two coaches for Canada at the time. You could see them just sort of standing back and watching it. So mm -hmm. Cron's job was to, to really animate the activities and stuff, but the head coach would kind of stand off over here and 
be able to gauge people's body language, watch their focus levels, watch their communications, and uh, and get some insight onto like what those players are like and what their character was. I mean, and you knew that he was making some tough decisions like in the moment, and uh, he had some good justification for the ones he made. Mm -hmm. And fun fact, I've actually never been on an international tour that did not have a first time front row player in the group that actually had to play an international as their first game in the front row. And that that's maybe just the reality of the Canadian context, John, right? It, and that was like sort of one of the things I was sort of talking with a, a colleague about online was he was asking about what markers a uh, a forward should be able to be like able to to perform in at what developmental stage or like what age and in Canada like we don't get contact with some of our best players till they're like 16 or 17 um, and certainly not at the rep level so you know what I want a guy to be able to do when I encounter him in Canada U18 is Really, it's about the physical profile more than anything else. And then, is he open to the teaching? And we'll we'll kind of get to more about that in a minute. But uh, the truth is, it's not hugely important that they have a huge, like a ton of experience. All they really need, and again, if we're if we're teaching all eight forwards the same way in terms of their body shape their isometric ability to resist and their ability to apply force as an individual, when I get them, that's all I need them to be able to do because we're gonna teach them the rest. And you know, from my perspective, I'm only teaching a certain amount with the 18s boys because it's directionally tailored to where they're going with the 20s, but I'm not gonna teach them everything that the 20s guys are gonna teach them. Like if I tried to do that, you know, they're, they're not gonna retain it and they won't learn the stuff that I want them to learn anyways. So I try to keep it really, really simple and tailored to what they absolutely need to know. And anything that goes beyond that is like individual conversations and stuff and what our review process is. And we watch them scrummage and they have reflections on what they learned by like playing against X guy, uh, difficulties they had or things that were successful. Um, and we kind of let that sort of drive that process. Awesome. John, I do want to make sure we have some time for a few more questions. There's quite a few that have come in. Um, so oh, why don't you get us to that Get us to that secret sauce? What are those basic things that you want to make sure they can all do outside of, yeah, I mean, you talked about uh, those three components of, of the uh, of the profile. However, what are some of the things that we can we can do now as a team to as or as an individual to get prepared for that? So like the, the big stuff is following the sequence. Um, their ability to hold shapes. So like, this is one of my favorite activities where you're developing a little bit of like neck strength, um, core stability, and their ability to hold their body shape at the 120 degree leg angle. Um, you, we move from there to dynamic strength and mini units. So getting their bind processes comfortable. Um, one of the one of the big deals with the buying processes and stuff and like working with with guys in a variety of contexts is helping people get into their own body shapes positionally uh pre-engage and post-engage without any assistance find helping props get into like as close to the bind position as possible with no assistance from locks or back row um and then the unit work and then we're able to assess what you see in competition in a game. And then what you learn in that game will inform your next round of intervention as a coach. So if I see, for example, that my flanker over here has only got one foot on the ground, then a big focus for us might be for him to recover his shape after the initial push in the scrum. Um, so in, in my objectives for a session, am I targeting the setup? Am I targeting the bind to fire? Am I targeting the fire in? Am I tiring the in, uh, targeting the introduction of the ball? Or am I targeting the delivery from the back of the of the scrum? Each one presents like its own like, like 
type of headache or uh, different challenges and, and work-ons for players or for units, but they all come back to those same basic principles. And when you have those principles, when they're super clear for the player, then when you're giving them feedback, the language is the same and they're able to recognize themselves what, uh, what needs correcting. Um, so the, the video piece becomes hyper important. The more feedback they get, the better off everybody is. Um, I won't spend any time on this, I don't think, because it seems like we, we got some stuff to talk about other than that. Um, but the vet, like as a scrum coach, the variety of, uh, of situations you find yourself in. Uh, sometimes you have five minutes up to two hours, a huge range, de range depending on what the purpose of the activity is. Uh, timing, is it the beginning, the middle, and the end of the session? So are they fresh or are they bagged? Is it early in the week? Is it close to the competition? All of these things factor into how you design the activities. What's the focus point? What phase of the scrum are you trying to address? Is it an individual focus or is it a collective focus? And do you have all the players available? So sometimes you just need to find the time within the session to do what you need to do. So for example, like if our a big work on for our group is the setup, but we don't have the time in the in you know the plan for the setup. I identify the need, but we don't have it uh, in the in the books. Typically, what we do is find a way to work it into the other activities. So, like if we're doing launches from a variety of areas and stuff, we just make sure that like that's where I coach the setup is in those the, in those moments. So every opportunity to teach becomes a teaching opportunity, and we just got to make the most of them. Um, possible obstacles. Again, we're not going to talk about that too much because that's not really what uh, we need to address. I guess this is more what we're talking about. So the key capacities for front row players. Some they're born with and some we've got to grow. So the, the big piece, man, is uh, their genetics. Is Do they have a thick neck? Do they have a, a spine that's going to be able to sustain it? Even if uh, a guy has got the mental attributes and stuff, for a guy to be able to progress to a reasonable standard, he's got to be able to like physically stand up to it over time. Some guys can do it for a couple of years, but eventually like their bodies are going to break down if they, they don't have the, the bone structure or the, the musculature to do the job. Um, I guess like you're not going to pick guys solely on physical profile, but their ability to resist and apply pressure with their neck is a really, really big deal. And their ability to not break down when they're doing it core and posterior chain strength can they apply or resist linear force uh it's about resistance as much as it is about application sometimes what your nine wants you to do is hold that scrum steady and you got to be able to do what the team needs so it's really about building the ability to scrummage successfully and that means different things at different times sometimes you're trying to like beast the team off the park other times you're trying to create attacking opportunities for other players Rotation and anti-rotation, which is one of the biggest uh, neglected areas in our guys, is they can plank for a long time, but if they move a hand, they get into a whole heap of trouble. So, a lot, like giving them opportunities to work on like a tripod stance as opposed to a four point, um, yeah. adding resistance that's pulling their bodies in different directions as they're moving. Uh, you see a lot of banded work that's really great with this. Uh, you see players kind of climbing up on each other's backs and, you know, doing kind of carry activities. Those are, those are super valuable and that's why they have that value. Can they get into those body shapes unassisted? And do they have the power to dominate an opponent and recover their shape? And again, you're going to see this is done in a, in a specific sequence right. is this, these top two here are all about safety. Right. If the guy's body is not ready to do it, chances are when he tries, he's going to get hurt. Part of our job as coaches, whether you're a scrum coach or just like a high school coach, is to help them build the physical capacity to do the job, which has its challenges in Canada, considering the constraints you have around contact time with kids. Like it's a it's a testament to the to the hard work of the people out there that are that are making it happen, that it is happening. But it's something that we need definitely more of. There's a really great Activate program that the that World Rugby's put out. There's a lot of really good resources in there that relate to these two things. 
uh, actually the top three, I'd say. And we only really started thinking about that power stuff when the kids are kind of graduating out of the uh, out of the age grade system and stuff. Yeah. Well, when that's when it starts to be important to to selection. Does that sort of answer that question a bit? Absolutely, mate. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure we got that in there before we get to uh, a few questions. Um, anything you want to make sure we wrap up with, uh, John, before we get to a couple? There's two I absolutely want to make sure I ask you. Sure. The, the last thing I wanted to sort of talk about is this mental toughness. Is can they self-regulate? So self-regulation really refers to the ability to control what's going on inside your body when you're not in control of what's going on outside your body. Scrummaging is a fight. And if you fight a lot, chances are you're going to lose a couple. If I'm talking about the attributes of a guy who's going to make it in this game, is do they have the ability to fight back after a bad one? So that, and we've gone well beyond what mm -hmm. we're talking about with, uh, with you know, like new players or players that are just being introduced to the forwards. Or if you're looking at a guy that you think might be a good forward down the track, their ability to fight back is a huge, huge attribute that every good forward needs. 100%. Uh, so I, I included now like a, a sequence of activities and stuff that sort of reflect the different stages that we could be at. Um, I can close I can close with those uh, if you want to get to the questions now. Sure, mate. Um, there's two, and I appreciate everyone um, hopefully hanging on. We're, we're going to go just a few minutes over the hour, but there's uh, a couple of questions, John, that I thought really um, – if you you know some insight would be really beneficial to the group and the first is around uh you know you talked about some of those core competencies um uh for a player to to get prepared for going into a scrum and stuff uh what are some other resources you talked a lot about some all black stuff but uh, is there anything out there um specifically that uh, other notably introductory coaches or people who are just getting into some scrum stuff and just trying to coach their high school team what are some other resources that might be available? I, I know it costs money, um, and it, it would be great if everything was free, but the, the rugby site have some incredible resources. Um, in terms of like just the quality of the instruction, the clarity in the language, and the, the reliability of the information, because I, I got to say, like I've also like been through the internet, and the reason I don't reference a lot of other stuff on the internet since then is a lot of it's not actually all that good um it it's like but you'll, you'll just i think a lot of people can discern that for themselves again like back to that idea of like you have to think critically about everything that you're doing most of the time especially in something as volatile and dangerous as scrummaging can be yeah um so we need to have safety at the forefront of everything we do and if it doesn't look safe or sound safe or come from somebody who looks like they know what they're saying chances are maybe we'll want to look elsewhere. The best stuff I've seen is on the rugby site. Um, the RFU have a bunch of really great resources on YouTube as well. Right. Um, but if I could steer people in like one direction over another, I would stick very, very closely to the individual work, the pairs work, right. and then start to start building the unit stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I think that's a great point. I'll let you finish on that. I just got one more question that that really kind of struck me as, as pertinent was uh, around a lot of coaches, like you said, only have that limited amount of time. You gave an example of a of a having to coach the setup during uh, a larger component of a training session. Um, yeah. If teams have the time, do you suggest they do more of the unit work individually, or do you still suggest that? quite a bit or, or as much as possible, the scrum work itself happens within a larger component of what a team is trying to work on. How do you see that kind of interplay happening? So um, there's a couple of things going on there. In terms of like what, um, what the scrum means to your team, it depends what level you're working at, but I'll refer back to those videos of like the Japan uh, dominating France and then France dominating New Zealand. If the scrum is important to you, you make time for it. Um, also, there's such a huge safety component around it that is it are you being safe if you don't make time to teach it well? Um, the, the other piece going on there is like 
scrummagers tend to be scrum nerds and you've got some pretty good teachers in your group chances are if we're talking about like at a club level yeah. um empowering them to sort of like do their own stuff a little bit and uh and one of the other things that really struck me from uh from the Micron experience was the way that he instituted very early on in the group um, peer coaching as a norm within the group is you're expected to be able to give feedback to uh, your teammates when you're working on uh, the core skills of the scrum. And uh, he, he sort of demanded that from the players. And I think that's a hugely powerful tool when they're able to, to sort of like coach each other and develop an empathy for what, like when a, the back row is like realize the kind of fight that the front three are in, when they have the empathy for that because they're getting the feedback and they're actually having to scrummage themselves, those things carry over into game day and stuff. And you, like mm -hmm. one of the activities just down here, I'll, I'll sort of maybe finish on that one. It just reinforces those things. Yeah. But everything we're doing should as closely replicate the game as possible. So that, what that means is, is at some point, you're going to have to ask players to scrummage under some fatigue because that's yeah. the reality in game day. Yeah. And the more controlled that is, the more safe it's going to be. The first time they scrummage under fatigue probably shouldn't be on, on a game day uh, where well, there's no safety net and no coach to help. Absolutely. Well, why don't you why don't you fire those videos up? And then once you're done, we'll, we'll tee up our next set of webinars and say thanks. Awesome. Um, so the first one is just a small variation on the individual thing. We're talking about uh, different limiting factors for what a scrum coach is going to encounter. It's like, do you have all your guys there? Well, in this clip, it's actually it's Galou, uh, who's one of the, the C National Senior Women's Team members, mm -hmm. and uh, Mark Belvedere working on some uh, tight, tight head technique. So Galou's job here is to try to angle in and across. Mark's job is to push her out and then recover to a straight position. So it's a small variation on an activity that just about everybody does where we're sinking our knees, extending forward, and then catching up with our feet. Right. The reality is in, in scrums, and the refs know this as well as anybody, is that the scrum doesn't always stay straight, does it? No. Nope. Our desire to create top quality ball depends on our ability to stay strong with movement. And so this is just an activity that makes it a little bit more game specific for the demands that placed on this particular player. Mm -hmm. This can I use my head and neck to force my way back to being straight. Now, the second activity is a 4v4. So what you've got is a tight head and a loose head with two hookers, two second rows, and two flanks. The object is to develop our tight head's capacity to not move under pressure. So the players are going to hit in under control. And so as the coach, what I'm doing is sort of like controlling that engagement. So they get to get it set in there and get strong. And when I blow the whistle, the loose head is going to attack the tight head. And then the, attack, the tight head, the flank, and the lock have to work to not move backwards. They got to hold that shape for eight seconds. So, so why, why what eight we're seconds? doing there? Why eight seconds? Because it's typically the duration of time that it takes for the ball to get introduced into the to the eight feet. Just which is a lot of time. Which is, <laughs> which is a lot of time. Yeah. Which is a lot of time. It can happen a lot faster than that, but as we all know, in a perfect world, the scrum is a contest. It doesn't always go that way. And so, what we're doing there is we're putting the tight head under a lot more pressure than they'll ever have to face in the training environment with the safety net of it being controlled by a coach so that when the real game experience comes on chances are they're going to be in a better position to handle the pressures that come yeah 100 um as always folks we we don't get to all the questions john i you put a ton of work into this uh presentation today i i genuinely appreciate your time and effort we we go back quite a ways you and i as well so it was nice to get a little bit of banter in and be able to talk some rugby with someone it's it's always great uh and and the key message about the basics just needing to be reinforced at all levels of the game i think are probably one of the biggest takeaways and i appreciate you know you're you're emphasizing that as well so it's good stuff 
Um, well, folks, just before John, yeah, just before John and I say goodbye, just to tee us up for, uh, we're taking a break next week, and then we will be back two weeks from now. And, and so we're going to do two sessions uh, moving to Mondays in August, and we're going to focus on return to play activities. So what can return to play look like uh, when you're out there on a training session in some sort of uh, modified version of training? And then the second uh, piece to that is uh, moving into September. We'll be moving to uh, once a month, likely on Mondays as well. So stay tuned for more information on what that first RTP piece looks like. I uh, want to say thanks once again to John for the effort he put in. And for anyone who has any questions about returning to play, please reach out to your club first uh, or your provincial union. They should have all of the pertinent information as to what's happening locally in your in your area. So. John, mate, thanks again, and, and last word to you, bud. Uh, nope, thanks a lot for the opportunity and uh, for the time and attention of anyone who tuned in. Awesome. Cheers, guys. Have a good night.